This video is brought to you by the lovely people who support me on Patreon. My YouTube channel literally wouldn't exist if it weren't for them. Click the link in the description to find out what you get for supporting the channel as well. Each road and valley, hill and mountain, home and barn, shack and ski lift, vehicle and tool, friend and foe you come across during your stay in this digital recreation of the real-life mountain area of Mundown, Switzerland, are covered in textures that were hand-drawn by a single person through the course of six years. This is undoubtedly what put the game in the media spotlight, and it certainly is an impressive feat on developer Michel Ziegler's part. To say that every frame of Mundown is a painting wouldn't be an exaggeration. They all kind of are. And it's not just the surface level stuff. During my first playthrough of the game, I sometimes didn't want to move after a scene transition just because of how artistically pleasing the shot composition was. This method of eliciting black and white graphite drawings as textures is so much more than an eye-catching back-of-the-box feature though, as the results of this meeting creates a uniquely effective aesthetic in itself. I will now attempt to argue the importance of this aesthetic in relation to the plot of the game, by talking perhaps a little too deeply about memories. And pencils. I wanted my last video of 2021 to be about Mundown in particular, because what is more fitting to analyze in a video about looking backwards than a game that does just that, in more ways than one? There are plenty of horror games that have played to the strengths of monochrome palettes, most often taking advantage of dark to pitch black shadows. When something is, or at least looks like it was drawn by hand, it's usually based on thick black contours, most likely made using a digital display. Mundown, in comparison, with its slightly less harsh graphite line work, looks faded. Old. Quality-wise, it's not exactly on the level of a sepia-toned photograph, although it evokes the feeling of one. When you aren't concerned about what's lying in wait at night, there is this prevalent sense of nostalgia, of walking through memories of a distant past. As the playable character Cordine steps off the bus to attend his grandfather's funeral, you're almost immediately introduced to Mundown's most significant storytelling device, time travel by means of looking at and even stepping into various works of art. Some pieces will physically move you to a place and time where you get to learn more about Curdine's grandfather, what really happened to him, and why, while others will merely suggest a sort of mental transportation. As you observe one of the many art pieces around the village, the camera will slowly pull in on it, while the faint sounds of children playing, hammers hitting nails, or crunching footsteps over thick layers of snow gradually fill your eardrums. When you finally turn away, the sounds abruptly stop. You're back in the present. Life sucks again. Since all of the art pieces in the game, including photographs, were drawn with pencils, they tend to lack a lot of naturalistic details. Especially, and unsurprisingly, the kids' drawings are the most guilty of this. You can clearly see what situations these images are supposed to depict, but faces are abstracted or obscured. The scale of things might be a little off, and trying to figure out exactly where the events took place, by comparing the artwork to the world outside, is straight up impossible in most cases. That's not negative criticism though. It actually works in perfect sync with the story Mundan wants to tell. Through the course of the narrative, Curdine's personal interpretations of who his grandfather was is challenged. And what are all these art pieces, if not personal interpretations? We all believe that we have at least some vivid standout moments from our lives scraping around in the back of our minds. Little snapshots or film clips that we can dig out and take a long nostalgic or horrified look at from time to time. In actuality, Keeping track of your memories is more akin to playing a lifelong game of telephone with yourself. Child or adult, we don't just make memories out of the things we see and experience, but what we understand. The lack of knowledge and perspectives can simplify and distort the things that are really happening around us. Memories are personal, restricted. We focus on the details we find meaningful, that have the strongest impact, and willfully or accidentally forget the rest. 
as a memory becomes more and more distant, your feelings about it will inevitably change, slightly or even drastically, which in turn will change how you retell it to others and yourself. There is this great episode of the internet talk show Hot Ones where actor Paul Rudd excellently summarizes this while he's talking about his experience of being interviewed. After a while you get used to answering the same questions so you just kind of think of a different way to say the same answer and at a certain point I don't know whether or not that is the way it happened, if that's really true or it's just I've answered that question so many times that it's now the truth or the way I feel about it. Many people have asked me about how'd you get started, what was it? And I used to love those Steve Martin comedy records when I was a kid. And I was thinking like, would, maybe I want to do this for a living because of those. That was a, kind of the first time. And I've said that so many times in interviews. I think it's true. It might not be true. But I, I, it's such a limited window. You have a few minutes to talk about it. And then it's just, that becomes the default answer. Regardless if Cardine has personal connections to some of these past moments or not, the person he is now, as he's looking at these art pieces, several years after the fact, simply wasn't there. There is only the present day interpretation, the faint sounds of non-specific children playing. It's only when Cardine is allowed to literally go back in time that he realizes how different things actually were that he experiences any sort of clarity about his grandfather's or Mundown's past. The effectiveness of the game's visuals, in relation to the concept of memories, extends even to the aforementioned roads, mountains and valleys. One can easily imagine a version of this game with more photorealistic vistas, reminiscent of cheap gift shop postcards, undoubtedly pleasant, but with an artificial sheen. It shows you a destination only in its most flattering light which is then doctored and color corrected on top of that, in case it didn't look magical enough already. A postcard might depict what you wanted your vacation to be like. Simple, warm, cozy, full of colorful and sprawling nature. It doesn't include the fight you had with your partner at the airport, or that time your feet started to hurt during that really long hike, ruining the whole day trip. The graphite pencil approach makes the location of Mundown feel a lot more personal. It reinforces the idea that all of this is just an interpretation, specifically Michelle Siegler's interpretation. Like the art pieces in the game, the game itself conveys a sense of incompleteness. Graphite pencils are, after all, often used to create the basis for something grander. An old 1934 ad for the Venus Velvet Pencil proudly states that the Golden Gate Bridge was started with a pencil. The lines are not definitive though. They can be changed and erased. Eventually they're drawn and painted over with ink and colors. That this version of Mundown was left in a sort of sketch state speaks to the unpredictable ways it can and probably will change over time. How Mundown will change is ultimately up to Kurdin. On his last trip back to the past, he's finally given the power to change it. He can either choose to right the wrongs made by his grandfather, hopefully relieving the mountain of its lurking horrors, or he can let it all happen as it did, leaving the future of the community of Mundown a mystery. For a game that is literally in black and white, the ending, ironically, isn't, even though it may seem to be at first. I don't feel like spoiling any more than I need to. So let's just say that the choices are not simple, nor are there any absolutely good results. Again, it's about interpretation, what you personally value. To borrow from Aranok, who themselves made a great video about Mundown, no justice comes from more harm. Only more harm. But you should also fight to stop those who are doing harm. In Switzerland, there is a bridge called Teufelsbrücke, or the Devil's Bridge. Its namesake derives from an old folk tale about the canton of Uri cutting a deal with the devil to have a bridge completed. In exchange, they had to offer up the first soul that ever crossed the bridge. The devil, who obviously expected a human sacrifice, was fooled when he realized that the soul that the people of Uri had sent across belonged to a goat. This tale served as a major inspiration for the story of Mundown, and it strikes me as ironic that the supposed discovery of graphite, the stuff that was used to craft this folk horror tale, itself sounds like the start of a fantastical folk tale. 
According to legend, back in the 1500s, a bolt of lightning struck a tree during a storm in the Lake District of England. As the tree fell, a pit full of glittering black graphite could be found underneath, like some buried treasure at the end of a rainbow. It started being used to mark sheep, and then things just went from there. Who found the tree, and who was it that discovered its potential uses? No one knows. It's also very likely that this wasn't in fact the first discovery of graphite at all. Again, it's pretty damn ironic that one of the most well-known tools used for documenting in the whole world was never used to properly document how and where it was originally found. It does lay another interesting layer on top of the texture work of Mundown though. The fact that graphite pencils can only capture an interpretation is even baked into its own history. Its very core, along with the wood, wax, water and clay. Now Michel has said that the main reason why he chose to make the game using graphite pencils is simply because he likes drawing. So if he were to watch this video, he might react a little something like this. Yeah, 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 yes. However, I think this reading makes both the choice of aesthetic and the quality of the storytelling in Mundown even better. When the game was originally shown to the public, I honestly assumed that the look of it was just going to be a neat little gimmick. Something nice to look at while walking through a hopefully interesting, albeit thematically unrelated, story. I feel a little bad for underestimating the game. Not only do the aesthetics of Mundown matter, they're excellently intertwined with a deeply thought-provoking story of the unreliable nature of our memories, and how we choose to change the future based on the mistakes of those who came before. The visual aspects directly communicate the game's themes through the way they look and the connotations that exists within that look. Back in my very early teens, I both read and partook in debates about if good graphics in games matter on a website for a Swedish video game magazine. The definition of good in this case being more about how close the game was to reaching the level of the first crisis than the quality of its unique style. Now, two decades later, I want to declare that yes, good graphics do matter, but only because I've learned what I think is a better definition of what good graphics are. The graphics, the aesthetics in Mundown aren't good because they reach the same level of high graphical fidelity as Crisis. They're good because they matter. Because they are just as important to the story of Mundown as the characters and dialogue. After all, what are graphics if not a tool of conveying meaning within a work of art? As someone who has had people on both sides of the family who've made some pretty bad decisions in life, both involving themselves and others. I live with a semi-frequent fear that some of those tendencies could somehow live on and bloom within me as well. Mundown gave me a little comfort in that regard. I could absolutely ignore the lessons I've learned from previous family members. In some cases, I deliberately have, like when I started smoking at 22, even though my grandfather had died from it only a year before. I wasn't just hurting myself, I hurt everyone in my family by doing that. I mean, imagine if you lost your father, only to see your own child willingly choose to walk down the same exact, potentially life-ruining path. I was in my early 20s, I still had plenty of time to right that wrong. And eventually I did. By the start of 2022, I will celebrate two years of being smoke-free. Is there a risk that I could start again? Absolutely. However, I know that it doesn't have to happen. To borrow some lines from the great Natasha Bedingfield, I'm just beginning. The pen's in my hand. Ending. Unplanned. Hold on, I've already ended a video with a song lyric recently, I can't do it again- Thank you all so much for watching. Last year, I made an exception to my rule of only naming the people who support me with $5 or more on Patreon. Since this is the last video of 2021, I think I'll make that exception one more time. So a huge thanks to everyone who has supported me for these soon-to-be two years, whether you're still a patron or not. But most of all, I want to thank Jonas Hagberg, Nichtschwert, Sindri LaRose, Rocky Dennis, Tobias Matson, Hovard Krugerud, Professor Flowers, Winders, Losty, 
Odd Shrew, Christine Fox, Dark Fry, Dylan Robinson, Eurothug 4000, Eli Berg Moss, Pink Bat Lynn, Sam Brunson, Gustav Granlund, Flim Flamberge, Rob Robbins, Seth Sard, Joystick Drummer, Sable Cow, Reno with an eh, Mark Flynn, Ephemeral Mist, Izzy Jellyfish, Felix Marlin, Lily T, JK, Starlit Mansion, Oscar Sandström, Freya Steno, and Melange Rubin. I also want to thank Aranok and Kiki from Transparency for proofreading the script and helping me get various art terms right. I also want to thank literally the best person in the world, Emma Hogdahl, for providing me with some amazing looks for this year's videos. And speaking of looks, some of you might be wondering why I'm not showing my face in this video. Well, did you see the last Game of the Year video I made? Will I ever be able to top that? I can't! So we didn't try. <laughs> I hope you all had a nice year, in spite of everything. Next year might be better, or worse. But regardless, I'll be here. And I hope you will be here too.